thank you for your flexibility, Marcus. Uh, Marcus is from University of Passau, uh, and he's going to talk about reproducible generalized method of moments uh, estimation. Yes. Thank you very much, Marcus. Yes, thank you very much, Rohan, for the introduction. I hope that you can see my screen currently. Yeah, we've got your, your slides. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Then um, thank you as well for the opportunity to speak today. So what I'm going to talk about today is lessons learned by my co-authors and me when we programmed uh, the R package PDynamC. The package is now available from the comprehensive R archive network and intended for estimation of linear dynamic panel data models. And when we started coding the function, we went to influential papers in the literature and applications therein, and just uh, oriented towards the functionality that we require. So we based it on the papers. And after, the pro after programming the package, we went back to the papers and tried to reproduce the results. And this talk is basically um, originated from what we got there. Now, in the remaining minutes, I'm going to talk about um, first about least squares estimation to set the stage and uh, state the key differences between least squares estimation and generalized method of moments estimation. The next, I will introduce linear dynamic panel data models and GMM estimation of linear dynamic panel data models. And uh, we'll then come to two particular applications and the challenges we faced when replicating the results reported there. At the end of the talk, I will also try to put everything into a broader perspective beyond and go a little bit beyond um, a mere reproduction of the results. Of course, reproducibility is a great accomplishment in its own right, but uh, I will more or less talk then about uh, replicability in a broad sense and how you can um, you know, strengthen the claims that you make in the paper, maybe in the end. And for the specific context of GMM estimation of linear dynamic panel data models, of course. So let us start with least squares estimation. And um, if you consider now a particular research question and different researchers work on this question, then they may consider different assumptions to be plausible and they may even be equally plausible. So it might be difficult to discriminate between the assumptions that different researchers seem plausible here. And one popular choice of a specification is here multiple linear regression model. And um, you see here a cross-section dimension indicated by I and a time series dimension indicated by T. So we're going to deal with panel data during the rest of the talk. And um, we have a dependent variable YLT. We have explanatory variables X1 to XK minus one. We have coefficients beta zero to beta K minus one, which we want to estimate. And we have an error term epsilon IT. And uh, now in least squares estimation, we are basically estimating k coefficients based on k equations. So we set up our minimization criterion and then we minimize this criterion and derive particular equations from which we estimate our coefficients from. And one implication of the minimization criterion and in least squares estimation is this that you use that the expected value of the error terms here is zero. Now, in GMM estimation, the things are a little different. So basically, you have over-identification typically, and you have uh, more equations than you want to estimate coefficients. The equations are basically derived from the modeling assumptions. And in the context of GMM estimation, they are also referred to as population orthogonality conditions or moment conditions. And um, yeah. A first important difference is basically that while in least squares estimation, you have exact identification and you have as many equations as you want to estimate parameters. In GMM estimation, you have over identification, you have more equations than you want to estimate parameters. And what you could do then, of course, is throw out some of the equations. However, however this um, throwing out of information might not be really desirable and uh, might be considered inefficient and might not be what you actually want to do. And um, GMM estimation is then an alternative where you basically aggregate those moment conditions that you have to um, those J moment conditions to exactly K equations such that you have K equations in order to estimate your K coefficients. 
Then um, if you go further, another key difference between these squares estimation and GMM estimation is that in the squares estimation, everyone knows the closed form that you can derive. And um, in GMM estimation, you have a criterion which allows you to proceed in estimation via different steps. So basically, you can carry out one step of GMM estimation, but you can also carry out a second step. And in fact, you can also iterate there. Now, if you think about what you're doing in those two types of estimation and least squares estimation, you can think of as uh, that you're weighting observations, while in generalized method of moments estimation, you would weight moment conditions. Uh, basically, you use those sample analogs to the population orthogonality conditions, and then you would weight those and end up with the estimated coefficients in that way. After this uh, brief introduction of GMM estimation and uh, contrasting it with uh, least squared estimation, I come to the actual motivation and contribution behind this talk. So um, it's um, important to have the results that are reported in your paper, of course, reproducible. We heard that a lot during the sessions today and yesterday. And now, if you want to reproduce GMM estimation results, then uh, for many applications, this is not that straightforward. And sometimes it varies if you can reproduce the results or not so much. And this then, of course, has implications for the interpretation, the credibility of the reported results, because if you can't really reproduce it, then it's also difficult um, to see where the error is. If you have the data available and still you can't reproduce it, then maybe something changed in the estimation routines. But if you can't really um, investigate this further, then it's quite, um, yeah, or it might be, it might be a little red flag for the credibility of the reported results. Now the contribution of this talk um, is that in uh, GMM estimation, there is a large number of modeling decisions that you face and that the applied researcher needs to decide upon. And uh, now in order to make GMM estimation results reproducible, certain guidelines are basically required from a documentation perspective, for example, but we'll come back to that, that in the later parts of the talk. And towards the end, I will give some outlook on guidelines for modeling decisions, so how you could structure that and how you can basically obtain some insights on this variability of the modeling results if you um, change the modeling decisions or if you consider this across different modeling decisions. I said before that we want to estimate linear dynamic panel data models by GMM estimation. Here we have a linear dynamic panel data model in two equation form. We have a dependent variable y at t, which uh, we have on the left hand side and the right hand side, we have the legs of this dependent variable. We also have here further covariates x, and those further covariates can also be included in contemporaneous form, or it could be also legs of this covariate. Then we have an error term here. And this error term now can be decomposed into an individual specific effect eta i and an idiosyncratic remainder component epsilon it. If you think about this equation and uh, note that the legs of the dependent variable are here included as explanatory variables, and you have the structure of your error term, then you see that uh, you have an endogeneity problem here because your explanatory variables and your error terms here will not be uncorrelated. Now, a standard approach in this context is if you face endogeneity, you think of instruments and then use those instruments instead of the endogenous variables in your estimation. And this is basically also what we're doing in GMM estimation of linear dynamic panel data models. We're deriving instruments or moment conditions from modeling assumptions, and we derive those instruments or moment conditions with respect to two different equations. The equations in levels are just what you saw on the previous slide. And the equations in first differences are then here denoted by the del operator, by the first differencing operator, by the delta operator. And when you subtract y t minus one from the equation for y t, you end up with this expression and basically an individual specific effect drops out here. Now, I said before that you impose certain modeling assumptions and Actually, I'm not showing those modeling assumptions now. I would have those in the backup slides, but 
I will uh, skip them for now. And those are moment conditions that you can derive then from your modeling assumptions in GMM estimation of linear dynamic panel data models. Frequently applied, employed are linear moment conditions with respect to these equations and differences, and also linear moment conditions with respect to equations and levels. This guy right here and this guy right here refer to the instruments that you're using in those moment conditions. And this and this refers to the equations. We'll note here that you have some unobservables given here by delta UIT and UIT, but basically you can express those unobservables in terms of observable model components and parameters. And then you can um, yeah, employ those moment conditions and estimation. Now, if you look at the longitudinal dimension here, then you will note that the number of available moment condition, conditions blows up when your um, longitudinal dimension blows up. So typically, we have many more moment conditions than we want to estimate parameters. And here, the generalized method of moments comes into play. And it allows you to aggregate those um, moment conditions to just as many equations as you require to estimate your k parameters. And now the objective function that you're minimizing is given here. We have uh, denoted by this m bar here, the sample analogs of the population moment conditions and the weighting matrix W here, which guides the aggregation of the moment conditions. And uh, now in estimation, I said before that you use a weighting matrix, or now you see that you use a weighting matrix. And uh, a contribution from a paper by Avellano and Bond was basically proposing here a weighting matrix, which is also derived from the modeling assumptions. So then you have your moment conditions here derived from the modeling assumptions. You also have your weighting matrix, which guides the aggregation of the moment conditions derived from the modeling assumptions. And uh, this is something that you can do then in a first step. If you proceed in further steps and minimize this objective function as after you obtain first step estimates, then you can basically employ this first step estimates in order to estimate the weighting matrix here. And you can iterate and um, do this over and over again as many times as you desire. Here then come the practically relevant related questions into play. So first of all, an applied researcher has to think about the types of moment conditions that he wants to use in his GMM estimation. And this more or less boils down to the theoretical assumptions that you're willing to impose here. Then you have an estimation routine that you want to use. So for example, you could carry out one-step estimation, you could carry out two-step estimation, or you could also iterate and um, repeatedly minimize this objective function. Something else that is of uh, practical relevance, but not really relevant in theory, is then the instrument count and the correlation of the instruments. Because in the theoretical world, you have your moment conditions which hold when uh, your modeling assumptions hold. But when you change to the applied world and you work with limited uh, data sets and limited data, then uh, it may be the case that you just have not enough observations in order to include all moment conditions. And, uh, one example could be if you have relatively high correlation between instruments, then you might just not have enough information to estimate this weighting of the moment conditions here, basically. So a practical consideration is the instrument count and the correlation of the instrument among each other, and also the correlation of the instruments and the thing that you want to instrument. So let me come back to the examples that I promised in the beginning. So when we coded up the PDNMC function, we first of all considered which functionality um, would be desirable for applied researchers. And there we picked those two papers among other papers. And um, yeah, I basically have those two papers because they are concept conceptually relatively different. So they employ different um, assumptions from which they derive the moment conditions. And um, we also have different uh, or make different experiences when we try to reproduce the estimation results from the two papers. 
So we tried reproducing both with our PDNMC function, but um, yeah, for one paper, this was quite straightforward. For the other one, it was not so much the case. The Review of Economic Studies paper by Arellano and Bond is a paper which um, investigates employment by firms and the reaction of firms to shocks. So employment is here labeled as N and then you model employment by lags of employment, by wages, lags of wages, capital and their lags and also output and its lags. And uh, what they want to do is assess the adjustment of employment by firms. Uh, they also consider a firm specific effect to be um, yeah, something that you might want to include in this equation. Then they estimate the specification by GMM estimation of linear dynamic panel data modeling. The data is publicly available. So one of the uh, levels of reproducibility that we heard yesterday in Ben's talk is, is uh, fulfilled more or less. And uh, also, if you read the paper, then it's clearly documented there what is done. If you're familiar with uh, certain estimation routines or certain um, implementations of linear dynamic panel data modeling, you can uh, basically read the paper, make some notes, and then put this in the software. And it's straightforward then to end up with this uh, replication results here or with these results. So the estimation results here are fully reproducible. For the second paper that I provided as an example here in this, or that I want to provide as an example in this talk, this is not so much the case. So this paper is also um, yeah, influential in its field and considers here losses from habits. And what the paper does basically is it investigates household expenditures for different types of goods. And the goods you see here is food consumed inside the home, non-durable services, food consumed outside the home, alcohol, tobacco, clothing and small durables. And um, uh, here, um, Browning and Collado here estimated these specifications. So you have lagged budget shares of the respective goods. You have um, logged real total expenditure and you have certain households characteristics, for example, the number of children, the number of adults and the age of the wage earner in the household. And uh, what uh, Browning and Collado do in the application is they first classify goods according to the coefficients that they obtain here for the lagged budget shares. So if you have a positive coefficient here, for example, then they say that the good is um, habit forming and you have a negative coefficient, then they say that the good is, um, um, the good is uh, durable. Durable would mean that if you consume in one period, then in the next period, you would uh, consume less of the good. And habit forming would mean that if you consume more of the goods in one period, then you would again consume more in the next period in order to reach the same level of satisfaction and the same utility basically from consuming that good. Now, um, when the paper is uh, very nicely written and the data is also publicly available, we had uh, some trouble when replicating the results because there's just um, relatively many parts uh, floating around in GMM estimation. And if it's not quite clear how certain uh, leeways that the researcher has were used, then it's also not entirely clear and um, how to reproduce the results and uh, substantial amount of reverse engineering is required here. So one thing that is done here, for example, is that not all the theoretically available moment conditions are used. This is um, documented here and uh, yeah, I guess it's fairly well documented, but the identifying restrictions are not um, all that clearly documented here. And um, another thing is also that iterated estimation is used. And uh, if you don't know the type of software and the version of the software that was used, then this may also be difficult or was difficult for us to reproduce. Maybe there was different stopping criteria that they employed compared to us or um, yeah, it could also be that there are certain bugs in some software packages and also the application is from 2007. So it might be the case that also the software changed over time and that uh, this leads to the estimation results not being fully reproducible. 
this leads me already to the conclusion based on those um, things that we reproduced when coding up the PDNMC function. So basically, in order for GMM estimation of linear dynamic panel data models to be fully reproducible, some reporting guidelines are required and the reporting guidelines greatly facilitate the reproducibility. What um, you have to, or what you should document is uh, the source of identifying restrictions at first. So which assumptions, which theoretical assumptions that you used in order to estimate your model. Because then you could, for example, also a discussion could also be sparked in the literature if somebody else considers different assumptions to be more plausible. And uh, this could then also be a fruitful discussion there, for example. Also, the specific use of moment conditions and their weighting is something that um, is very important to document. If you, for example, exclude certain moment conditions because you have a high correlation in a limited sample, then this should also be clearly stated and maybe um, shown by a correlation matrix or something else. And um, a third thing then is the estimation routine, of course. You should also document as clearly as possible how you got your results. So for example, if you used a certain stopping criterion or a certain number of iterations, this should all be given there in order for your results to be fully reproducible. And uh, now I will try to put this in a little bit uh, broader context as I promised before and provide some potential extensions that go beyond uh, mere reproduction of the results of GMM estimation here. So if you report the variability of your results, then this may also basically increase the credibility of your conclusions. This goes in the direction of a specification analysis, specification curve analysis that was proposed here by Simonson, Simmons and Nelson. And what they propose is basically to consider equally the equally plausible assumptions that you could alternatively impose. If you write down one model specification, then another researcher might actually write down a different specification. And if you only report one, while well, you estimated three, four or five in the background, then this is not the whole story. And this is basically what their, what their paper and what their proposal boils down to, to report a broader range of modeling estimates in order to strengthen your conclusions. Then uh, what could also be something to strengthen the conclusions drawn from linear dynamic panel data estimation and to show a broader picture is uh, if you carry out a systematic specification, curve, uh, specification search this was proposed by Kivier in 2020 here, and um, is more or less a structured approach in order to end up with a final specification here. And the third thing, a uh, third thing could be you could characterize the implications of the instruments for inference. If you think about highly correlated instruments, for example, and you exclude some instruments for certain purposes, then you could um, also show how this affects your modeling results. This could also be valuable, inf uh, valuable information for other researchers to um, yeah, discuss, for example, your conclusions as well. So let me show something briefly what you can currently do with PDMC. You can uh, report some of the variability and uh, we currently implemented, for example, a plot which shows you the range of the coefficient estimates across the GMM iterations. So here you see, for example, in uh, with a gray circle, the initial coefficient estimate. And with the diamond, you see the final coefficient estimate from iterative estimation. And the coefficient range then is indicated via this um, dashed line here. So this gives you an impression more or less on the variability of coefficient estimates across iterations and can be quite, quite helpful and can show you how much this the coefficient estimates are basically bouncing around. Now, if you consider particular coefficient estimates, then you can also um, consider those coefficient paths. This was um, inspired by something that we saw in Hansen and Lee. In their paper, they had some uh, coefficient path analysis. And if you consider those coefficient paths and they jump very much from one iteration to the next, then this would also mean that um, yeah, you should be maybe a little more skeptical about your estimation results. And this is just two small things that you currently can do with PDNMC in order to assess 
something like um, different assumptions that could be equally plausible or also the uh, variability of your estimation results across iterations. And with that, I thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to hear any comments, suggestions or remarks. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, does anyone have any comments or questions for Marcus? Do just uh, feel free to raise your hand and I can call on you. Let's get a start as maybe um, folks can uh, put something in the chat or they can raise a hand. Uh, is it these minimal reporting requirements that you sort of talk about, uh, would you see this as being best being documented in the paper or, I mean, where, where do you think this sort of fits in the life cycle? I mean, I think this, uh, the minimal reporting requirements is something that should be already in the paper, I guess. Um, of course, in a company, accompanying software or accompanying code, if you submit something to code checker, then some of this would, would really be relatively obvious. And then if you publish your code, of course, it's also obvious if you also publish the data, then others could just use it right away. But it's more or less um, for those studies who, who do not do it, it should be a minimal requirement that you can basically carry everything out. And additionally, the data, of course, also should be available then. So this is from our perspective, more or less the, the minimal, minimal standard. It's not, it does not go as far as, as uh, Ben suggested yesterday, and it's... Uh, yeah, it goes more, it's maybe a little bit above what the, the what the heck uh, stadium of this, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, and then uh, if anyone has any comments or questions, feel, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll call on you. But, uh, so I mean, to what extent do you think that computational environment affects things? Um, do, you, do, you, do you see large, large differences? I guess it plays a certain role, yeah. I mean, we worked closely with uh, Stata and R here and with certain implementations there. And for example, if you iterate GMM estimations, then uh, something is uh, conceptually implemented a little different, at least uh, from what I noted in, in Stata and R, for example, in Stata, it's allowed that instruments are excluded across iterations. And uh, this is not entirely unplausible, I would say, but um, it's allowed in a way that from one iteration to the next different different instruments could be excluded. And uh, this is something that is different in RNS data, for example, here. My final question. So if anyone else has any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I'll call on you. But uh, have, you, have you integrated this into your teaching at all? And like, how do you, how do you find students reacting? Um, um, you mean the reproducibility part of it, or um, I mean, we basically go through this Arellano and Bond paper. So this is something that we're illustrating. We are letting the students um, read the paper basically, and then uh, play around with the software a little bit and uh, just make them try to set up the specification. I guess this works works quite, quite uh, good for this example. If you, of course, invest some effort into getting into the modeling structure and also the, also the language, because this, of course, also differs across software packages and might also be, in certain ways, a, a hindrance sometimes to transfer something from one software language, language to the next. But yeah, I guess just thinking back to the social science reproducibility platform, uh, presentation of, uh, of Fernando yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone else have any other comments or questions? I was going to say thank you to Marcus. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Marcus. Thank you very much. I think that Mar we, we were expecting Marco.